Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Palm Beach County's monthly Zoom event. We have our special guest today, John Dalton, the CEO of Optimum, Optimum RTS. He'll tell you a little bit more about himself. And without further ado, John has a great presentation for you. So I am going to turn it over to him. John, welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for uh, asking me to come and share some information. I'm really, really honored uh, and really pleased to do anything I can do for Encore and, and helping our folks here in Palm Beach County. Um, I believe uh, a big part of my business model and just my personal belief is to help advocate for our seniors uh, in the community. Uh, I've been doing so for over about 20 years. Uh, my company is Optimum RTS. We are a full service uh, medical and professional employment agency. Uh, and I've been in this industry since just about when I started my career in 1991, um, really working uh, to help those in our community um, uh, find their next position. Uh, I believe very, very strongly um, uh, the three pillars uh, of my company are honesty, service, and respect. Um, I believe in that so, so much. I, you know, folks that uh, are less than truthful um, are not someone that I want to have in my life. Uh, I've dealt with a lot of businesses like that through my life, um, and I really tried to set myself apart from that. Um, and service is obviously uh, doing just what we're doing now. Not only do I want uh, myself to be on the community helping, but I'm trying to get my staff to also do the same thing, and we serve a lot of different uh, communities, whether uh, uh, usually the underprivileged um, uh, and minorities, uh, the seniors, uh, our, our gay and lesbian friends, and sort of everyone in between, uh, because it really takes a village and, and that's so, so important. And I'm glad to see Ed here because he certainly is part of our optimum team um, and someone that I believe has the same core beliefs we do. Well, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today um, is really a multi-generational and intergenerational um, workforce in our communities because, you know, what we're seeing, and especially through the times of COVID, has been uh, a weird time for all of us. Um, those of us who own companies that are trying to hire, uh, those seniors who have retired uh, and now have found that... Uh, uh, They've lost a little hey, bit of their vitality because Good. they're not working it out in the community. Um, and uh, there used to be a transition where people would be coming back into the workforce after the retirement, and we're just really not seeing that. So today we're going to talk about a few different things. Oh, let's see if we get there. Um, can everybody see my presentation? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. So what we're going to look at. Um, is first we're going to talk about and define what a multi-generational workforce is. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but usually when I'm giving these lectures, I always like to go ahead and start so that we all have the same basic understanding and definitions of what it is we're looking at. From there, we're going to look at the population on the whole, and we're going to look how that workforce uh, is today and how it's gonna be moving over the next, I think it's 18 years to like 2030, um, and how that's going to change. Um, that'll be the future trends. And then we're gonna talk about, you know, how do we really integrate a workforce where we have uh, boomers working with uh, myself, the Gen Xers, working with the millennials, uh, working with the Zs, and uh, what's to come next will be the alphas. Uh, that are behind us. And uh, uh, Christine and I were having some conversations about just how the perception of work has changed. And uh, for me as an actor and the boomers out there, we have to uh, sort of see where we were, understand some of the things that we maybe shouldn't have put up with and realize that the millennials and the Z's have watched their parents and grandparents put up with things that they believe they shouldn't have um, and how um, we have to respect them for their decisions and they have to respect us for what we can bring in. So really working together. 
So with that being said, let's start off with uh, what is a definition of multi-generational workforce? So really that's a workforce where the personnel is comprised of people from several different generations. The average lifespan has been extending up until the last three years. And now it's actually retracting a little bit uh, because of COVID and some other, uh, some other external influencers uh, that are causing our lifespan to sort of decrease again. But I think we're gonna see that increase again. Um, so what it really means is that you have individuals that are choosing to work well past 65, uh, for myself, Social Security said 65 is not good enough. Now it's 68. So, so I have to work an extra three years to get my full Social Security, um, as well as the cost of living just keeps going up. And what we thought we had saved that we could afford to live on um, isn't quite going as far as it could. So the generations that we're going to talk about today are going to be the traditionalists, which are probably your mom and dad's, really. Um, then we're going to talk post uh, World War II, where we had our baby boomers. Um, the baby boomers led into the Gen X, which is myself at 55. Um, the millennials, uh, or they also call them Generation Y, but really the common phrase or common vernacular is the millennials. Um, uh, they are going to be making up a largest portion of our workforce right now. Um, and then following them is Gen Z, and as I said, Alpha. Um, the way that I like to give lectures is that um, I have no problem being interrupted. So I'm not able to see you all on the screen, but if you have a question, please, please take your microphone off uh, and speak up and I'll be glad to answer any questions as we're moving along. Uh, and I also left time at the end so we could cover that and some questions as well. So, so let's look at those different generations. They were traditionalists, okay? So what did they experience in their life? They, World War I, World War II, the GI Bill, the draft, okay? That were coming in just the beginning of World War II. They saw work really as an obligation. They aspired to own a home. Changing jobs? No, they didn't change a job. They became a cobbler and they stayed a cobbler for life. They went to a factory, they worked in the factory for life. They went into banking, they worked at the bank for life. Um, career paths were just slow and steady. I started sweeping the floor at the factory, then I was a mechanic at the factory, then I was a foreman, then I was the accountant, I was the CEO, and they moved up like that. With boomers, we saw that change. That's like 1946 to 1965. Uh, I was born in 66, so I'm like right on the cusp there. Um, what did they experience? They, they saw television come into life. Uh, they saw the moon landing. They had Watergate that came around, Vietnam War. Those are all things that really went ahead and affected their lives. My brother's a boomer. Um, and those are things that I remember as a very young boy. He was scared about being drafted to go to Vietnam. And he had all of that other uh, uh, discourse that was happening in the world that they saw. Um, they just felt like work is expected. I have to go do it. I've got to expect it. You know, the only thing that they aspired towards was job security. Changing jobs, again, much like the traditionalists, they were very loyal to their employer and they connected their personal values to the corporate values. So they let the businesses decide what their values were going to be. And the two were connected very, very uh, close, uh, uh, very, very closely. Her career path, they wanted upward mobility. So same as their mom and dad that were the traditionalists, they were slow and steady. Now the boomers just want that upward mobility. For myself, Gen X, you know, I saw the beginning of the uh, electronic revolution when we had the handheld video games. We saw our first Nintendos. We went from uh, record albums to cassettes to CDs to digitalized music. Uh, uh, you know, work really for me was a difficult challenge because I had to live up to the expectation of my parents who were the boomers. 
but my values were changing a little bit. And like we were talking about Christine, I put up with things that um, looking back on, I don't feel I really should have put up with. You know, case in point, 1991 or so, Hurricane Andrew comes through. I was working in a bank here locally. Uh, we got a call from the bank, the manager saying, uh, we need everybody to come in on Saturday and Sunday to help close down the bank to make sure all our files are protected and everything is protected for the company. Uh, and I said, well, my dad's 100% disabled and I need to go to his house and help him close up. And they said, well, that's fine. You can go to your dad's, but just don't come back here after the hurricane is gone. You know, it's your job to help us out. So it was a difficult challenge for me. You know, I was looking for a work-life balance and a little bit of independence, but really work always took precedence. It was always a 60 hour work week. It was always the company comes first. It was always whatever I could do for the company. And if I missed, a, you know, if I missed some stuff at home, well, that's just, just what I had to do to make work, work, uh, uh, work for me, you know, not to be redundant in the words, but uh, using two different definitions. Um, changing jobs uh, was necessary for compensation um, because what we really saw too for myself is you saw when I started my career, every year I would get a 10% raise or something that was substantial in my same company. As it progressed to the 2000s, all of a sudden now, um, as it moved forward to like the 2000s, all of a sudden the corporate expectation was you're going to get a 3% raise. You know, our max raise every year is 5%. Jesus Christ himself, if you walked on water, is not going to get 5%. Mm -hmm. So expect you're going to get a 3% raise. Um, so you had to sort of change. Um, career paths, you know, we all, we wanted to stay on our same career path, but it was a need to know and options now. Once we get to the millennials, there's a big change that comes along. The millennials had natural disasters. Diversity was coming in. Mobile technology is huge. My, uh, my daughters who are Gen Z, which they're calling Gen 2020 in this, um, I asked them what a busy signal was when they were about 10 years old and they had no idea what it, I don't know, dad, is that the look you give me when, when you're doing something and we try to bother you? Um, was literally their answer. They had no clue because uh, you know call waiting and everything else was there. For millennials, work is just a means to an end. Changing jobs, they expect to change their jobs. Uh, career paths is switched frequently and fast. Why? The only way for a millennial to move ahead with a company is to go from one job to another job to get that 10% raise. Think about what a 3% raise is. If you're making $100,000 a year, you get $3,000 spread over 26 pay periods, minus taxes, Thanks for the $78, guys. Most people are making $50,000 or under 50,000. You're making 15, you get a $1,500 raise. Thanks for the $30, 30,000. I mean, the only way for them to make money and have their financial ability grow is to switch your job. Why do we have such high turnover now? And why have the corporations not figured it out? I don't know. I own an employment agency. I hope they don't figure it out because I'll just help getting them new employees. Um, the Gen Zs, they experienced the economic, economic downturn, 24 hour news cycle, 24 hour news cycle where bad news is coming at them at lightning speed every time they turn around. Global warming, looking back at the boomers and those that run the country, not taking global warming seriously. Seeing our forests burn, seeing our wildlife die, seeing you know, our rivers die. I live up in Stewart, and since I've been in Stewart from 1985 to today, I can tell you the change is dramatic and visual. Um, those are things that my daughters have seen, okay? Work is constantly evolving, changing dog jobs consistently. Careers are all multitaskers. It's become a gig economy that they're working with. 
So age diversity right now in our workplace is at the widest gap ever, okay? It's common for organizations to have three or four generations sitting side by side, right? Think about that. If you have a 20 year old and you have a 60 year old working at the same organization, which is very, very common, that's where we get into the intergenerational workforce that we really need to talk about so that folks can understand that, you know, the boomers and us, uh, us uh, Gen Xers, we have to understand where the millennials are coming from. But we need to get the millennials and Gen Zs to also understand that we have the historical knowledge of how companies run and everything just can't be a startup uh, and we can't just keep blowing up everything that we have to create something new. There has to be a transition and that's up to us to work and talk to them about that. So where are we going to go in the next three years? 2025, if you sort of look at this, you can see the millennials, which are the darker blue right here, they are making up the largest percentage of our workforce. Myself, the Gen Xers, we're making up the next largest. And boomers are really at the end of their career. That's anywhere from 60, 60 years old and up are going to be those boomers. And they are slowly dropping out. Or not even that slowly. If you look at 60 to 64 to 65 to 69, that's almost a 50% drop there, um, maybe like a 45% drop. And then again, almost another 50% drop between 69 and 70, 74. So, so we're seeing those folks uh, age out of our population, age out of our workforce. However, my mom is 83 and she still runs her dog kennel up in Massachusetts. She has one of the largest dog kennels uh, in the country, uh, state certainly now, used to be the country. Um, and she works that for six months out of the year with occasion because that's how she stays vital. So where are we gonna go in the next 18 years? I should say 18, not eight. If you look at that, the Gen Zs by 2030 are making up almost 40% of our workforce. Gen X is behind them. Baby boomers are just about gone and the silent generation are gone. So it's the X, the Y, which are the millennials, the Gen Z, and now the alphas. You can see the alphas growing. Um, even in 2020, you see the alphas in the gray here are making up a very large portion of our workforce uh, with the Gen why Gen Zs uh, also making up part of that. And our Xers, the alphas are almost uh, outnumbering us at this point. So um, what are the benefits of a multi-generational workforce? Well, including a range of ages in your staff, it really adds value to an organization because it makes it more appealing to deal with both the young population and the older population. My company itself, um, we're made up of folks that are ranging from, you know, plus 65 down to 26. And the way that we're able to share ideas really is so beneficial to the growth of Optimum RTS because of the fact that we're able to deal and react to situations that are coming at us much more quickly than those that have either a very young staff, tech startups, or you know a very senior staff that's not able to keep up with the Snapchats and the Instagrams and the Facebooks and the new way to hire. When I started recruiting back in 1991, my biggest expense at that point was putting an ad in the Sun Sentinel and running print ads to find my staff, okay? Someone, a millennial, a Gen Z, have no idea what a print ad is. You know, they may or may not ever held a newspaper, and if they did hold a newspaper, it was probably because they were trying to start a fire uh, in a fire pit in their backyard. That's the only reason they have a newspaper. Um, all of their information is coming through the digital world. But at the same time, for me to run my company, I need to know how that digital world is working. So the knowledge of our senior staff 
can talk about how to negotiate a contract and talk about how to uh, 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 persuade uh, an employee to take this position or take that position and be able to see what's coming down from uh, the actions of our clients that are going on and predict what's going to happen much quicker than my millennials and Gen Zs. They don't see it coming. They, they haven't lived those same experiences. So it makes it very, very difficult for them. So there's a huge benefit for that multi-generational uh, workforce. But for us here in this room that are on the top end of that age range, you know, being, uh, being uh, Xers, being boomers, uh, and maybe uh, some of into the traditionalists, we have to understand the value that we bring in, but we also have to understand the value that the millennials and Zs are bringing in. So benefits. So let's go through some of them. Multiple pr perspectives. Different generations, as I just said, have different ways of viewing the job responsibilities, sharing those perspectives across the different generations is important. There's something to be said about longevity. My wife is an interior designer. She's been an interior designer since she graduated college back in 91. She's licensed. She's grown her career year after year after year after year, and she's become very successful at what she's done. However, she's tired with interior design and she wants to go do something else. And we talk about that. And we're like, well, you know, honey, you can do whatever you want to do, but understand you're a senior project manager in the company you're in now. You're making a very good salary. And if you decide you want to go work at a yoga studio, you're going to be a brand new yogi making $15 an hour. Are you going to be satisfied with that $15 an hour? Maybe there's a way we get you out of the interior design and continue to grow on that path so you can turn your $50,000 salary into a $60,000 salary instead of becoming a yogi and turning your $50,000 salary into a $20,000 salary. We understand that because we had to have that stability in our growth. Millennials are switching jobs willy-nilly. Today, I'm a waiter. Tomorrow, I work at a lawn service. The next day, I'm a medical assistant. By doing that, they're continually restarting, restarting, restarting. And even though you may have got a little bit of a raise from going from being a waiter to being a cook or from being a cook to uh, uh, working at a lawn place, that caps out and that growth will stop. So it's up to us to let them know, hey, you know, you could switch jobs, but stay on the same path. So you're getting better. And we can teach them that. Problem solving abilities. That's really, really great because we have good analytical brains. But I can ask my 26 year old staff a question and she or he can have the answer back to me within three minutes that I can't do that because I just don't have those technological skills to be able to reach into Google and be able to find this information as quickly. So they have something to teach me. Learning and mentoring, you know, this is something that I, when I'm doing corporate training and I'm looking at staff and companies that have high turnover and I see who's turning over either the younger population overturning and the senior population staying stable or the senior population leaving, uh, and I'm using the word senior very liberally, I'm talking anyone from 50 up, um, the more mature population or employees leaving and the younger staying, you know, that's one of the things that I say right now is that mentoring is key, but mentoring doesn't have to happen from me to somebody younger. Somebody younger can mentor me on how to use Google. 
on how to use Facebook, on how to use Snapchat, on how to use Instagram. So that helps bring your team together so that there's mutual gain on both parties and you can have that mutual, uh, you can have that mutual respect. Knowledge transfer and retention. We have been in business for a long time. Everybody here in this room has been in business for a long time. We understand that time kills deals. We understand a lot of things about how the business is going to go, how deals are made, and the process it's going to take to get from a phone call to a product going out the door, whether it be a service, whether it be a product, whatever it might be. We understand that um, and, and we're able to keep that. It's like if any of you ever worked with a nonprofit organization, you know, why do you keep an immediate past president on your board? Because they have the knowledge from the past six years, eight years, however long they were president. So when someone says, hey, let's do this, they can say, we've already done it. And this is what happened when we do it. So that's very, very important to be able to have that when we're working with that. Oh, sometimes this goes fast, I apologize. So five multi-generational management practices. You want to build teams and, you know, we go back to, we go back to middle school. You have a boys table and you have a girls table and the boys don't sit with the girls and the girls don't sit with the boys and the boys talk about boy things and the girls talk about girl things and they don't mix. Well, you know what, when you're in the workplace, it's the same thing, except it's not all based on sex. Many times it's not based on a person's sex, you know, not to be confused, um, but you'll see the more senior staff sitting with the more senior staff talking about senior things. And you see more of the junior staff sitting with more of the junior staff talking about, you know, nightclubbing and video games and all of these other things. So as leaders, what do we have to do? We have to break the natural tendency of us all going off into our own peer groups and only staying with our peer groups. We have to create teams that mix our generations together so that that team is going to be stronger because you have the institutional knowledge of how and what the team needs to do along with the tech savvy knowledge and, uh, uh, and just the millennial mindset put it together. You know, younger employees can help provide guidance and insight with innovation technologies and strategy. The knowledge transfer can lead to greater collaboration and more innovative ideas. Our ideas, my ideas are stale. My ideas are stale because I've been working my ideas for 30 years. I ran a meeting this morning, Shan, South Healthcare Advocacy Network. And when I started off, we were talking about leadership. We were talking about networking, leadership really. And I think I used the quote pretty much that, you know what, I'm a pretty darn smart guy. And I've been in healthcare a long time. And I understand home care and I understand skilled facilities and I understand the different needs of our senior population. But I am no smarter than anyone here in this room. And if we took the eight or 10 people that are with us right now, and we took our institutional knowledge and put it together, now we're a force to be reckoned with. Because together, me and Christine are super smart. And then you add in Miss Kettle, and now we're wicked smart. And then you put Ed Grubman in, who's the chief hugging officer of all of Palm Beach County and everyone loves him and can get our message out. Oh my God, we become unstoppable. But we have to understand that and we have to break the natural cycle. That's happening. And many times our senior management, 
whether they be a more senior person or a younger person, will only associate with those same folks within their organization as well. So what does a leader do? A leader has to lead from behind. A leader doesn't tell people what to do. A leader shows people what they can do. So if you're a leader of an organization and you're talking to the younger folks in your organization, or if you're a younger leader and you're talking and associating with the older people in your organization, isn't that setting the tone for everybody else in the organization to do the same thing? Because really don't we all just want to follow? Really don't we all just want peace and harmony? You know, that's what a leader does. And that's why we're going to build teams with mixed ages. We have to be aware of communication preferences. Um, let me look around for a second because I had this written down. I guess I didn't have this picture. But, you know, the boomers, they want to get a letter. <laughs> they want to get a letter. Pick up the phone and call me. Talk to me. You know, the Gen Xers like me, all right, send me a letter, but you can email. But still, pick up the phone and talk to me. Millennials? Oh my God, sending a letter in writing? What is that? No way, what am I ever gonna, you're gonna get an email. Don't ever expect to get a letter. I don't really wanna call you. I'm probably just gonna text you. When you get to the Z's, communication is out the window. I look at my two daughters who, you know, I love more than life. They don't have any communication skills whatsoever. They will not pick up a phone and call their friends. They will constantly misread what's going on because they have it in 180 characters or less. They just do. I say, you know, what's going on? I don't know. The, I, I don't know. People didn't answer me yet. I'm like, well, pick up the phone and call them. Oh, no, I can't pick. You know, people don't want to be called. <laughs> people don't want to be called or talked to, you know? So when we're working in our offices, we have to expect to get texts from the younger folks in our office. And if we want to communicate with them, we're probably going to be better off texting them than we are calling them. I run an employment agency. I help people get jobs. You would think that if I'm calling you to say, hey, I have an interview for you to go on, you would call me back. You know what? They're not gonna call me back because they never even listened to the message. They never even heard the message. So what we do now is we will text everybody first because everybody will text us back quicker than a giving a call or sending an email. So it's like a text first, an email next, maybe a phone call to get in touch with somebody. Bonus programs. Why companies haven't figured this out yet, I don't know. But as I said, let them stay dumb because they keep coming to me because they're losing their staff and they don't know why. It costs anywhere from five to eight thousand dollars to replace a person in your company, whether you do it on your own or you do it through me then the training program that goes along and then making sure they're part of your team goes along, making sure all of that is going right. It ends up costing thousands and thousands of dollars, but their policy says I can only give a $50,000 person a $1,500 raise, which is on the very low end of the cost to replace them. Why not spend the money on your existing employees and make them happy, then have to pay it anyway to get somebody new that's an unknown quantity so create a bonus program and what you should expect when you join a company if you're running a company that that rewards them for their loyalty by rewarding their longevity and their productivity that's how you're going to keep the younger generation part of your organization. 
If you don't do that, well, then they're going to switch jobs. They just are. The other thing, and this is this is very, very important when we're dealing with the millennials and the Gen Zs, is to set clear expectations. I very much believe in servant leadership. We lead from behind. People will say, oh, because we all dealt with the boss, you know, he or she, who was, give me the numbers, give me the numbers, bleed more, bleed more, bleed more, do more, do more, do more. And they ran like a dictatorship. And they got very low results out of their people because they were burning their people out. But you can be a servant leader and be able to lead from behind, listening to people, having people come up with new ideas. But part of that is setting clear expectations and setting goals for the people that you're working with. If they know a goal and you know a goal and you're both able to articulate it to each other, then they're going to fit it more frequently than those are just told what to do. There's study after study a study that shows that. Some of you maybe know me in person, others of you just know me from here. Uh, I'm a big guy. I have a big voice. I command a room. I walk in and I'm the biggest personality in the room. I am at my office too. But I believe in servant leadership and I know that I am wicked smart, but I'm not nearly as smart as the people that I work with that are doing the job that I'm not doing every day. So when I'm dealing with my office specifically, I'm the last one to talk. I'll ask a question and I will let everybody else in the room talk because that's where great ideas happen. If I come in and I just say, hey guys, this is what's going on. We need to do this, this, and this. You know what all the other less people that have a, 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 a smaller personality than me, if you ever looked at personality style traits, I'm a very high D and I. Uh, if you see those that have SCs, which are more detail oriented than I could ever be, um, they just won't say anything. And those ideas will be lost. So, so you have to realize who you are. You have to realize how you present. And then you're able to go ahead and get fresh ideas. I was in a, giving a lecture once for the Florida Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology conference in Orlando. And I had about 100 people in my room. And we were talking about best practices, customer service. And somebody said, and then, you know, so, so what are some of the best customer, you know, best customer service aspects you could do with your, with your, with your patients? And I just left it open. And a PA that was in the back of the room said, I have an idea. What's that? She goes, what if every time we have a new patient come to our doctor's office, we ask them, because retaining patients is important to us as a doctor, what if we ask that new, pa new patient, what are the three most important things to you when dealing with the doctor? And then we took that response and we put it right in the chart on the front of the chart. So every time we walked into the patient's room that they came back in, we saw the three most important things and we made sure that we touched on them when they were there. Do you think that would help us? Do you think that would help patient retention? It's like, oh my God, that's brilliant. <laughs> that's brilliant. I mean, what a, what a great idea. And I've been back to that conference and I've talked to other doctors and Many of them said that they implemented that. How nice would it be for you to walk into a doctor's office and have the doctor know 
that you don't like it when he or she is looking at the computer and not at you. How nice would it be to have the doctor know that you like to get uh, paper prescriptions that you can have in your hand along with them calling it in. And every time when you left, they gave you those paper prescriptions. And even said, hey, Christine, I know you like paper prescriptions, so here are your paper prescriptions. Would that make you feel more important to that? Would that make you feel more value to that doctor? Absolutely. Would that make you tell your friends about how great your doctor is? Absolutely. You know what I implemented when I came back? Every new client that I bring in, I ask them, what are the three most important things in dealing with a recruiter? And I make sure that we hit on those things over and over and over again. And I've set that expectation with my staff that we know that, we see that, and we're able to touch on it. We have to promote age inclusivity. We have to make sure that our employees feel valued. It's not hard to make your employee feel valued. It just means you need to be a good guy or a good girl woman, there are no girls in business, excuse me. Every time I go to a networking event, I pick up pads or I, I was at the networking event today. They had green beads on their, uh, the green beads on their table and chip clips on the table at Barrington Terrace. I grabbed five green necklaces and two chip clips. I came back to my office. I gave all the women in my office a green, you know, happy St. Patrick's Day, thinking about you guys. Hey, you know what, Julia, you're buying your first house. You know what every person needs in their house and you don't even know you need it yet? Here's two chip clips. Because <laughs> you will have a bag of something in your cabinet that you would love to be able to lock up or put a chip clip on. So, so you know, here's something that you're thinking about. Was that hard to do? No, it just took me a minute realizing and looking at, wouldn't this be a nice thing to do for somebody else? Doesn't that make my staff feel good? I hope it does. You're gonna make me feel good that I was thinking about them? Yeah, sure. Group interviews, that's another thing that's age inclusivity and it's down here. It's not, it's in the written words but I'm not gonna read verbatim. Every time that I'm interviewing, I go through the initial interviews with my new staff to think if it's gonna qualify the person. And I talk about the have you, can you, did you's of the position. My second interview is always with my entire staff where I bring the person in. And the question is, does this person fit on our team? And I have my uh, Lindsay who is, uh, uh, you know, early 20s in the interview. And I have Alicia, uh, which is in uh, mid to late 50s in the interview. If Ed's in the interview, if Ed's around, he could sit in the interview too. Um, and I have them all talk to the new people that are coming in. And then I get feedback from everybody in the room. And nine times out of 10, if they say hire, I'm gonna hire. If they say don't hire, uh, I'm not going to hire because it's their company. It's not my company. My company is nothing without them. And I realize that. But don't we as leaders have to also realize that for all the other organizations that we either work at or in or for or own? Absolutely. So, you know, those are some of my ideas on our multi-generational uh, and intergenerational workforce. Um, what I really wanted to do was, you know, open it up. Uh, let's just, uh, you know, have a discussion for the last 10 minutes or so. You know, um, where do you see the workforce is heading and how do you fit in? Please somebody speak up. You can unmute yourself or raise your hand, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, John? Yeah, Ed. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, excellent, excellent presentation as usual. 
Um, it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to work with you and for you as well. Um, it, it's interesting. I'd love you to share your thoughts on work ethics, soft skills. Obviously, um, uh, our generation was uh, basically were brought up on, on excellent, with excellent work ethics and soft skills, very respectful of our elders. And where do you see our uh, existing workforce in that area? Where are we going with that? Um, you know what? I, I, that's, a, that's a really great question. It's, it's a really great question. And the immediate answer that comes to mind that, that you hear that becomes stereotypical, I see that somebody made a chat comment. Uh, Christine, if you could see if that was a question. It says um, excellent presentation. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, so, so the easy thing to jump to is to judge people by our own life story and to say those millennials, they're lazy. They don't want to work. They're not loyal. You know, they're not loyal. They're just out for themselves. You know, that's, that's what you'll hear. You know, you can read article after article after article and see, you know, a little snippet and snippet about that. I don't buy it. I was abused as a young employee. Abused as a young employee. Put your head down and bleed more. Don't help your dad. Help us. Interview. The company doesn't call you back. So, so we put up with it. We put up with it. The millennials and the Zs are saying the heck with that. My life is short. I'm not going to go to work every day and be abused. Not going to go to work every day and be abused. So, so, you know, I have a great respect for them. I wish I could take 30 years back and go back to Aquin and say, I'm sorry, my dad's not gonna be around for that long and he really needs my help more than I need this job. You know, bye-bye, <laughs> you know? So, so, you know, I have respect for them. I don't think that their work ethic is as bad as we think it is. I think that we have expectations as boomers and Gen Xers that they're gonna put up with the same junk that we put up with because for whatever reason. So what do we have to do as leaders of organizations? We have to understand that and make sure that they are having um, and they are having what they need fed, okay? Um, Optimum RTS, one of my paid holidays every year is your birthday. Your birthday. You know what? My little John Miss is just as important to me as Christmas because that's my day that I was born. And heck, I want to celebrate that just as much as I want to celebrate 4th of July, some arbitrary holiday that I may or may not get if it's on a Saturday or Sunday. You know? So, how do we recognize our employees as a person and recognize what they need? As a business owner, does it cost me that much money to pay somebody for their birthday, having their birthday off? No, it doesn't. You know, I know when I was young, I always wanted to take my birthday off. I tried to take my birthday off every year and I had to use PTO time for it. And I was usually told I couldn't have the day off because there was something else that had to be done that day that was more important than my birthday. My employees, I tell them, you know, why are you here? <laughs> it's your birthday, go home. I don't want you here. Leave, please enjoy your day for yourself. So, so you know, to go back and circle to your question, Ed, the easy answer is they're lazy, they're not loyal, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not. But they watch their mom and dad sacrifice their little league game, sacrifice their time with them, sacrifice their dinners. And they're saying, no. No, I'm not going to do that. That's not life. Life doesn't happen at work. Life happens outside of work. I work to live. I don't live 
to work. So the sooner as Gen Xers and boomers, we realize that, the more we're going to see how to get the production that really needs to have and make a more harmonious uh, workplace for ourselves as well. I see you want to say something. Um, thank you, John. Uh, thank you for reminding me. You, now you owe me two days uh -huh. uh, since I've been working with you. No, in any case, no, I was thinking mostly or sometimes as to the people that schedule interviews they do not show up. They do not have the courtesy to call saying something's happened. Can I reschedule this interview? You know, I, I just cannot understand that. And obviously I'm old fashioned in many ways, in many respects, but that's something that's my pet, pet peeve that uh, bothers me a lot. Um, I know that you're not like this, Ed. I know that you're not like this, however, many companies have had interviews with employees and never called them back to say they didn't get the job that's true that's many true. many people have sent resumes in and never gotten a call saying they got the resume so didn't we sort of set the expectations on the corporate level for what we're getting back now you know isn't this like a weird form of karma you know, for years we did it to the employees because it was an employer based economy and we didn't have the respect for the employees. Well, now the employees are doing, they're just, they're just giving us back what we gave them for years. Yeah, but I, you know, two wrongs, does it make a right? I, I just don't understand that. I know that I've been yeah, wronged yeah. by the company, but it's me. It's, it's, it's how I was brought up. It's, I don't know. I'm different, I guess. The hardest, you're, thing you're, that I, I, the hardest thing for me to learn as a leader and a manager is that people aren't going to act like I act. Right. Yeah. Lower your expectations. This is Kathy, and I just wanted to share because I can identify. I'm 72 years old. I'm still working. Love, love, love my career. Had a phenomenal experience. Um, but exactly what you just said, you need to lower your expectations because um, the whole world functions differently and has different values, is, which exactly what John was going through, through the whole um, presentation. I was blessed to go to work for Eula Packard HP in 1978. So I have been living the values of the millennials since 1978, but I'm 72 years old. And all I can tell you is when I'm with my peers in other industries, not high tech, I really struggle in my dialogue with them because they have that boomer mentality. And it's just a very, very different world. And first you have to say, I value myself and me. And do I wanna work in an organization that doesn't want to work with me? Right. And that's the first thing I say to myself, because I've been interviewing for a year now and, you know, it, it, you know, it, it, I'm going, I'm living in a different place. I'm not in a high tech world. I'm all of that is gone, gone. And I'm really struggling. But the first thing I say to myself is, do I want to work with a company that doesn't want to work with me? And I, that's how I approach every interview, every dialogue and, and every position that's offered. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you 100%, Kathleen. I, I would make one little modification. Um, I don't know that I would, I would phrase it like lower your expectations because that has a negative connotation to it. I, I, would, I would try to change that and reverb it to something just to be understand the people we're talking with. You know, because I'm not going to say that my expectations are lower because you're a millennial. My expectations are lower of you because you're a millennial. I think that it's it's just we have to understand where they're coming from and, and not have to lower our expectations because my expectations of myself are my expectations of myself. And I can't put the expectations of myself on somebody else. I have to understand what their expectations are and and uh, either accept it or not accept it. But but I don't know that I would lower my expectations. But I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yes, thank you, John. That makes good sense. Uh, as you said, those words, 
it became clear to me that I do not understand their values. And right. therefore, I uh, completely just, you know, uh, back away. So, but what you're saying is learn to understand the values of the younger generation right. and try to find that middle point that is going to accommodate both. When I talk to my daughters and I talk to my staff, you know, I have little clutch catchphrases. And one of them is you have to ask the question you don't want the answer to. And you have to say what's hard to say. But if I don't ask the question I don't want the answer to, I will never know the answer and it will always just be me in my head trying to figure it out. You know, do you want to date me or you don't want to date me is what a conversation I have with my 16 year old. You know, not, you know, this constant cat and mouse game going back and forth, which is, you know, fun and teenage, blah, 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 blah. But you have to know where you stand at work. When we have clients, you know, do you want to hire this person or do you not want to hire this person? Do you want the job or do you not want the job? I don't want to hear from a client that they don't want to use my company anymore because they think that I'm not that good. So we won't talk to them and you stay away from them because I don't want to hear them say, I don't think you're very good. But if I don't ask that question, I won't know that they think I'm not very good. And if I don't know that they're not very good, they think I'm not very good, I can't ask the follow-up question. What is it about my service that makes you think that? Excellent. Right? So, so we, have to, we have to ask those questions. So when people are not calling us, and I lecture a lot at the colleges, and I ask the kids, you know, why is it that you guys just don't show up to interviews? And their answer back is, because I go to interviews and they never call me back anyway. So what does it matter? <laughs> So, so, so it's like okay well then there you go <laughs> okay wow um, okay. what knowledge do you believe that you want to share to those entering the workforce today john would you be will this is carolyn kettle would you be willing to share your email address i, I had a couple of questions i just I could share it here, but not to take everybody's time. Um, could connect with you with just a couple of quick questions. Sure. Uh, Callan, do you have a pen handy? I do. It's J as in John. Uh -huh. Dalton, D-A-L-T-O-N. Yes. At? Yes. O P. T I M U M R for recruiting, T for training, S for staffing.com, J Dalton at OptimumRTS.com. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, you and have, I just put it in the chat too. You have been very, very interesting and helpful. And kudos to Encore for keeping up their good bar of giving us really good insight on these programs. Well, thank you, Ms. Kettle. Thank you, Carolyn. Actually, Rosemary Nixon, our founder, had raised her hand. We can't, we can't finish up without Rosemary speaking to you. <laughs> Rosemary, go right in. Well, I try to wait till everybody else has asked their questions, and, uh, but I'm not going to wait for forever. Uh, so uh, before I ask my question, I just want to remind people that um, Optimum RTS has a job portal on our website under work resources. So if people are looking um, for a position um, or even if you know of somebody who is, once again, I would remind them to go on our website and check all the job portals out. And, um, you know, that's something I'd like to say, even though um, we've been doing this for five years and building up our base of resources for people, I constantly get people calling me who are looking for work and they, they went on our website, somebody referred them. And I asked them, did you go on our, uh, the page on our website of work resources? Oh, no. 
Well, you know, why don't people do more homework? Why don't they exert more effort in uh, finding things? That's something I don't understand, John. But anyway, here's my question. Um, you covered beautifully um, the fact that uh, we have five generations in the workplace. And there's much research that has been done that show multi-generational teams can be more creative and productive sharing of skills in solving problems. What I, why do you think companies still do not recognize this um, reality and research? Do you think the problem rests at the HR level or the top executive level or the frontline manager level? As you're dealing with companies that don't seem to want mature workers, um, why don't they know these things? Well, uh, you know, I think a lot of it, uh, Rosemary, is going to come down to uh, human nature, like, likes, like, um, and, and, you know, breaking into those, uh, you know, going back to middle school, the girls table and the boys table, um, you know, it's just, uh, we naturally will put ourselves into groups. And then, you know, the other thing, the other thing with human nature is that, and I hate to say this, but people don't want to think. We have moved into a time where a headline is just repeated without ever reading an article. And, and it takes a lot of thought to think how we can make our company more multi-generational friendly and the benefits of that versus saying, oh, millennials are lazy, so we don't want to hire millennials, or the old, they're just too tired, they don't want to work anymore, because that's an easy thing to say, and it takes me no thought to say it, and I'm just repeating what I've already heard anyway, because I saw it on Fox News that millennials are lazy, <laughs> they're just lazy, I saw an article in Time Magazine that, oh, they don't, you know, it's their fault they're not showing up, but nobody is asking the hard questions. And nobody wants to have to think that hard. They just want to go through their day and just have status quo over and over and over and over and over again. And it really, it has to be a change in mentality from sort of everyone, whether it be HR, whether, you know, HR could say, hey, a multi-generational workforce is great. If your frontline manager doesn't buy it, it's not HR's fault, it's your frontline manager. Your frontline manager could be saying, hey, I would love a foreman that's been doing this for 30 years. But HR is going, hey, you know what? Someone that's been doing it for 30 years, their health care is way too, way too costly, and I can't have them on my health insurance. So, you know, we don't know where the variables lie that cause that type of um, um, thinking takes time, right? Thinking takes time, and people don't want to spend any time. We're, we're in the time of instant gratification. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's a lot to do with it, Rosemary. So we just really have to get people to understand the value of that multi-generational workforce because us, you know, uh, uh, Gen Xers and Boomers, we are certainly no more valuable to an organization than the Millennials and Zs. But conversely, they're no more important to us. But like, likes, like. So if you have a young company run by young people, who do they want to hire? They want to hire young people. So John, um, to you know, your goal is to find candidates that meet the expectations of employers. Yes. And um, so how much time can you really spend on trying to educate or change people's thinking or uh, have any influence in, um, let's just say, uh, the value that mature workers um, bring to the workplace. Um, and as you mentioned, the value of retaining mature workers, because it costs a lot less money to keep good people than it is to keep finding new ones. Um, I don't, don't know. Tell my clients that, Rosemary. <laughs> I mean, I learned that a hundred years ago. I don't know why other people don't seem to understand that. Well, it's, it's you know, Rosemary, um, 
I'm going to give you a story from just this week that is not about uh, an older worker or a younger worker. But it's, you know, my tagline is it's my job to understand your job. And I have a home care company that's looking for a recruiter to help them find CNAs, HHAs, and maybe LPNs. And he's looking for somebody that has recruiting experience, has understanding of what home health care is, what home care is, and what an HHA, CNA, blah, blah, blah is. Well, I had a resume come through for a woman who worked at uh, Burger King and another fast food restaurant, not Chick-fil-A. And she's been a recruiter for those franchises, finding burger flippers and front end checkout people and you know workers for McDonald's. And she's been successful in it. And I called my client and I'm like, here's a girl, woman, who understands recruiting, understands recruiting for low wage workers, understands recruiting for high turnover workers, doesn't have healthcare, but you could teach her what a CNA is. She has the knowledge that's going to allow her to do the job that you need to have done. She got hired, even though it wasn't what she was looking for. So with all of my clients, um, that's a company that actually hires me to find someone. Um, I continually do that. You know, here's Rosemary that has 30 years of experience. Um, you know, you're going to love her for this and this and this. You're not going to like her because she doesn't have this or that. But here's why you should hire her. Yeah. John, John you've touched on a very important subject, and that is the transferability of skills from one area of work to another. And um, I find uh, when I meet with people who are looking for work, they don't really understand how their skills are transferable to another area of work. Um, and it sounds as if you make the effort to help both the um, job seeker and the employer see that transferability. Right, I, that's, I, really, I really try to do that, you know? Because I experienced it in my life when I, you know, all through my uh, uh, early, uh, late high school years through college, I worked at restaurants. I, um, uh, it was some were nice restaurants, fine dinings, Chateaubriand's and table type Caesar salads. Some were, you know, fast food type restaurants. Uh, but when I got into the corporate world, it was up to me to say, yeah, you're gonna see that I'm a waiter. But I've dealt with multiple personalities I've dealt with the worst of the worst, the best of the best. I've had to multitask. I've had to you know, count money. I've had to do this. This is the best customer service training that you're ever going to get from somebody for this particular position. And this gives me the ability to do A, B, and C, even though you're not gonna see it on my resume. So, so I had to do that starting with myself and then you know, wash, rinse, repeat. Once you, once you see it and how it works, then you start to see it everywhere. You know, um, you know, what makes Optimum RTS special is that um, even though even though I have specific job orders for specific people, many times somebody will come to me for this position. Well, Lindsay Bolton, she's one of my she's one of my superstar great employees. She called me for an HR job, uh, a temporary HR job. And I talked to her about that job. I'm like, no, you don't need to be there. You need to be here. You need to be here with me because your skill is what we're looking for. And it, it totally flummoxed her at the time. She's like, whoa, who's this guy? Why is he like doing a bait and switch? Is this some sort of, but I, that happens all the time. Somebody comes to me for one thing. I'm like, no, you don't want that. You want this, right? Because this is the person that's looking for you. And just like this week when he's, when, uh, when my home care company said he wanted that, I said, you don't want that. You want this because, uh, you know, my wife would say, trust your interior designer, trust your doctor, and trust your recruiter. You know, if I'm telling you this is a person for you, you know, this is my profession. I do this all day long. So, so we just have to get people to understand that. Um, and usually if you tell them, they'll learn. Uh, John, uh, my last question. Certainly. And 
And uh, your firm, I think, well, first of all, the things that you're talking about is one of the reasons you were nominated as uh, an age-friendly um, business yourself. Thank but you. your firm specializes in the medical area of staffing, I believe, although you do other things. Yes, and this is a growth area in our economy here in South Florida. Um, what challenges are you experiencing in finding good candidates? No wages. Low wages, yeah. You know, but but you know, I have to I have to look at it from both sides because I run a small business too, and I know what my bottom line is, and I know what the cost of my employees are, and I know my ability to add revenue to my top line. You know, but if you if you're looking at someone that's making fifteen dollars an hour, that's you know, Carol, uh, Christina and I were talking about this earlier. Fifteen dollars an hour is six hundred dollars a week. Six hundred dollars a week after taxes is four eighty seven. You know, let's have lunch every day for ten uh, for five uh, for ten dollars. That's fifty dollars there. So now we're at four thirty seven. Let me put my kid in daycare. That's two hundred dollars a week. Now I'm at two eighty seven. You know, let's add a little bit of gas on there. Now I'm at two hundred dollars. So for two hundred dollars, I'm going to go work for forty hours for some guy or gal that's treating me like you know a piece of dirt that I'm their slave. You know, or they can go out and they can drive Uber and they can make two hundred in a night and be with their family all day and not have to pay for daycare. What would you do? <laughs> you know, that's, that's really, that's, the, that's what we're facing right now. But as a business owner, I don't have the ability just to raise my rates. You know, my workers comp went up by a thousand dollars. The cost of my ads is going up exponentially. The cost, everybody, you know, I say it to my office all the time because I have full disclosure with my office. I let them know where we are. Everybody has their hand in my pocket. Everybody has their hand in my pocket. So, so it's, it's, it's tough on both sides and somehow we need to find an equilibrium. Um, and so I think that's one of the hardest things uh, right now. And then as Ed said, you know, we have people that if we set up 30 interviews, only 15 are gonna show. We lose half to just no show, no calls. Um, you know, but I have that built into my day and I have my team, you know, we, we double book our, we double book our interviews because we know that 50% are going to drop off. So that way we're staying productive and we're getting the ones that are consistent. And my clients typically, um, when people come to us and we sell them on a position, the likelihood of them going to the next interview is much, much higher. So I'm saving my clients that time as well. But I think wages is the is the big thing, Rosemary. Thank you, John. You're welcome. I am going to ask for everybody's uh, everybody's help. Next Thursday night is a very big night for Optimum RTS. For the third year in a row, we have been nominated for the best of the best employment agency here in Palm Beach County. We've won the last two years. This would make our three P. Um, so I need everybody's happy thoughts, prayers, best wishes, warm thoughts, happy thoughts, whatever you could do, uh, send them out to the world because I certainly would love to be best of the best again. Um, and a big part you got, of that you got it. Is my team. Awesome. Uh, okay, you got it. Awesome. And John, I'm trying to close your screen share here so we can give you a proper thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, John, for an excellent presentation. You're very welcome, Paul. And we really appreciate your being here. And it's very clear to see why your organization was nominated for the Wisdom and Experience Award. So we hope to see you again this year because by following all of the ideas, concepts that you've shared with us today, I think we can have more and more people who understand that multi-generational really has quite a value to it. And so I really appreciate you really nailed it. And um, we may even use some of your yours to help pitch the wisdom and experience. So we'll be talking about that. And thank you everyone for being here. John, you will get the recording. And anyone else will be able to find it on our YouTube channel within a few days on corepbc.org.